looking at solutions in this unit and with your solutions um, this next little section is just a little bit of vocabulary about solutions in general and as we're looking at the solutions in general um, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to define the three different not really define, but go over the three different um, states of matter that you can find a solution in. Most people, their brain goes to a liquid solution. We think of coffee, we think of tea, we think of Kool-Aid, we think of um, tap water, salt water, things like that. But you can also have a solid solution and a gaseous solution. So we're going to go through the three different states of matter and go through examples of those states of matter in general. And then after that, we're going to um, talk about a little bit of um, definitions that apply to solutions as well. However, when we talk about this, it should be a review of things that we have had in the past. So when we're looking at our different types of solutions, the first one that we're going to go over is a solid solution. And a solid solution is called an alloy typically. Um, they are usually a metal and people always think about, well, how are they made? What you're going to have to do with a solid solution is you're actually going to have to make it in the liquid state. So let's say that we are making sterling silver. If we're making sterling silver, we're going to start with the silver. We're going to heat it up to its melting point, and it's going to be a liquid. Then we add the other metals to it. When we add the other metals to it. We stir it to make sure that everything is all evenly distributed. After everything is all evenly distributed, then you pour it into the mold that you want, and then it solidifies. Once it turns into the solid, it is called an alloy, um, and you have a solution that is in the solid state of matter. So this sterling silver bracelet cuff, whatever it's called, I'm not a fashion person at all, but I think it's called a cuff. Um, that is made up of silver and then you add other metals to it. It was made in the liquid state and the reason why it's made in that liquid state is because you have to mix everything together. They pour it into the mold that looks like this, they buff it out, and then you have a piece of jewelry. Now with that sterling silver, the alloy, um, it is stronger than elemental silver. If you have a ring or something like that made out of elemental silver and you wear it, it's going to misshape very quickly. It also tarnishes very quickly. So you add the other metals to it in order to make it stronger and you make sure that it doesn't oxidize. Same thing here with your chrome wheels. Chrome is made with a base of chromium. You add other metals to it, it's a stronger one and it stays shiny longer. So typically when we uh, make an alloy, it is because it is stronger than the elemental state. Um, another example is something like steel. If you have iron, you add carbon to it, it makes it stronger and um, the little molecules are arranged better. Therefore, um, we can use it for construction. Now we also have a gaseous solution. Um, the biggest gaseous solution that I can give you an example of is air. Um, with the air that we have, it is 78% nitrogen. People don't really think about that. They think, oh, we need the oxygen. So oxygen is the majority of air. That actually isn't the case. Um, you have to have more nitrogen than oxygen in the air because the first time that you would have had a lightning strike or something like that happening or the first time oh no my matches are empty um the first time that somebody would have done this so we light well it's not working if we light a match like this if the air was more oxygen than nitrogen, I would have just blown up the room. So that's not a good thing because oxygen is highly flammable. It's also in higher concentrations, very toxic to humans. We have to have the right concentration of oxygen in our air. So with the um, air that we breathe, it's this perfect mix of gases for human life to be supported. Um, if we have too much oxygen, it can cause brain damage, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, we have to have it, but not too much. Um, same thing, it is the primary component of combustion. You have a hydrocarbon with oxygen, you're making CO2 and H2O. So we have to have um, that certain amount of nitrogen to balance everything out. Now we also um, have the liquid solutions, and again, they're very common in the um, 
world, all over the place, you find liquid solutions. Um, but the one that I was going to talk about is the fact that you actually have oxygen that is dissolved in water. So a lot of people think that fish breathe because they can take the H2O, like water, H2O, and they take the oxygen out of that and that's what they breathe. That is not actually what they breathe. What a fish actually does is you have water that passes through their gills. And as you have those water that passes through their gills, there's oxygen that's dissolved into the water. If you don't have oxygen dissolved into the water, they can't actually pull that out. They can't actually breathe. So um, if you have stagnant water, the fish will start to come to the surface. They'll start to um, try to get more oxygen mixed in. So that's why you always need some type of you know, movement in that water to actually get that oxygen to break apart. Um, highly oxygenated water is going to be at the end of a waterfall. Or um, with a fish tank, you have a filter that's moving. That fish tank, the water that breaks the surface, it constantly oxygenates the water. That's what fish actually use to breathe. So the most common type of a solution is a liquid solution, like I said, but you do have examples of solid solutions and gaseous solutions, um, but usually your brain goes to that forefront and it goes to those liquid solutions right away. Now in this next little bit, we're going to talk about some things that are going to look like solutions, but they're actually not. Um, so remember, in order to be a solution, you have to have very tiny little particles. Those very tiny little particles have to be evenly distributed, and those tiny little particles that are evenly distributed cannot settle when they sit. Um, the tiny particles that are there actually have to be broken up to the molecular level, so very, very, very tiny. Now the first thing that is going to look like it is a solution, but it is actually not, is called a suspension. So with your suspensions, you have your um, particles that are going to you know, be all mixed together, but then when it sits, those particles are heavy enough that gravity pulls them down very slowly. So they're not actually a homogeneous mixture or a solution. They're actually heterogeneous because you have to make sure that you are keeping everything mixed together. And when they stop, like when you stop mixing, they settle to the bottom because the particle size is too big. So muddy water is a good example of this. If you get a, um, this is a little tadpole right here in the water. If you get a tadpole and you get all the muddy water, you let it sit overnight, those big chunks of mud and muck and everything else fall to the bottom, and then the water becomes very clear. So muddy water is a great example of a suspension. Another one would be Pepto-Bismol. Um, or any type of medication. If you actually have Pepto-Bismol at home and it's been sitting for a little while, you can actually pick it up and you can look at the bottom. When you look at the bottom, you're going to see a white ring. That's actually the bismuth that actually helps to um, settle your stomach, where the bismol comes from. So that's the actual medication part. So that's why when you have medication, you have to shake it up. It's actually a suspension. The particles are big enough that they settle to the bottom. So anytime you have a liquid medication, you're going to have to shake it to keep everything mixed together. So in the directions, if anything ever says shake well, it is not a solution, it is actually a suspension. The big thing with suspensions is that the particles are big enough that they settle to the bottom. They look like a solution, but they are not. Now a colloid is another one that is hidden, but this one is tricky tricky. Um, the reason why this one is so tricky is because when the particles are just sitting there, they don't settle to the bottom. The big thing here, though, is that the particles are not evenly distributed and the particles are too big. So with the particles being so big, they're not big enough that gravity takes hold of them. They're not big enough that you can pass it through the filter and all the stuff is actually going to go through. They're not big enough to get trapped in a filter using filtration. So colloids are very difficult to check unless you do a specific test. Milk is a great example of a colloid. You don't have to, sh sorry, you don't have to shake milk in order to drink it. It stays all mixed together. Now chocolate milk is a suspension because that chocolate settles to the bottom, but just plain white milk, you don't actually have to shake. The only way of knowing if you have a colloid or if you have a solution is by doing a test called a Tyndall effect. Otherwise, you're going to think that it's a homogeneous mixture or a solution. Um, 
a great example of this. Most people are going to think that your um, milk is a homogenous mixture. In eighth grade, they probably gave you that example. However, um, it's not. It's actually a heterogeneous mixture. Jello is another great example of this. Fog, when you're driving, you know, they tell you to um, turn your um, headlamps off. So, not your headlamps off, sorry, your high beams off, and we're going to talk about why in a second. Um, but all of these things, they're going to look like they're evenly distributed, but the particles are just too big to be considered a solution. So the only way of knowing if you have a solution or if you have a suspension is this Tyndall effect test. And your Tyndall effect test, um, it's being seen in this picture right here, but this cup right here, we have a solution. I know that it's a solution because the light is just passing all the way through it. The particles are not big enough to scatter the light. This one, however, that I know is a colloid. Because when the light hits it, the particle is big enough that it acts like a roadblock. And when it acts like a roadblock, it makes the light reflect away. So it kind of glows like this because the light is actually scattering throughout the, um, the uh, whatever you're shining it through. I don't want to say through the solution, but through the um, liquid. Sorry. The same thing happens when you're driving at night. So you guys are to the point that you are learning how to drive or you already just know how to drive. But one of the things that they always talk about on your driving exam is when it is foggy, people want to turn on their high beams to try to see through it. That actually doesn't work. That's because fog is a colloid. It's not a solution. The particles of water in fog are actually big enough that when the light hits it, it reflects away. So if you have your high beams on and you're driving through fog, when the light hits it, a lot of it's going to go back to your eyes and it makes it more difficult to see. This is also why fog lamps are at the bottom of your car. So when you turn on the fog lamps on your car, it's on the bottom so it's not reflecting back into your eyes in a direct line of sight. So when you have a um, solution versus a colloid, I'm going to move my picture here because this is a glass of milk, um, you actually have the light being all the way going through if it's a solution. So this one you can see that light, it's a laser, goes all the way through, no problem. This is a glass of milk though. The light doesn't even go to the other side at all whatsoever. That's because the little fat particles that are in the milk, when the light gets to it, it all reflects back. So nothing actually shines through the milk because the particles are large enough of the fat that it makes it reflect away. So the only way of knowing if you have a colloid or if you have a solution is by doing this Tyndall effect. If the light passes through, the particles are small enough to be considered a solution. If they're large enough that it reflects back or bounces away, then it's going to be a colloid. A suspension is the particles are big enough that they settle to the bottom when they sit. So when you're looking at your colloids or your suspensions, you have to figure out um, you know, which test you're going to use. So if you have something and you're like, oh, I don't know if this is a solution or not, let it sit overnight. If it sits overnight and nothing settles to the bottom, it's either a colloid or it's a solution. When you let it sit overnight and nothing settles to the bottom, you try to shine a light through it. If the light passes all the way through, it's a solution. If it bounces away, it's a colloid. Now we have just a couple more things here to define, and these are actually definitions that we've already had so far this year. So this is nothing new at all whatsoever. Um, but your aqueous solutions, the aqueous, we put the little AQ in parentheses after it, and that just means that it is dissolved in water. So whatever it is, is your solute, water is your solvent. So with your aqueous solutions, that's typically what you're going to see in chemistry. Very rarely do we use anything else except for water for your solvent when we're making solutions to use in the lab. But your aqueous solutions just means dissolved in water. Now this next one, um, this is from one of my favorite movies. It's called Idiocracy, and he always talks about... Um, the fact that water needs electrolytes. Um, so the next word is electrolytes because I can't ever talk about electrolytes without thinking about this movie. Um, I think it's actually, it's probably not 
I know it's not school appropriate, but I don't even know if it's age appropriate for you guys or not. But if you've seen it, it's great. Um, but he always talked about it's got electrolytes because they actually replace all of their water with something called Brondo. Um, and they say that water is only for the toilets. So anyways, that's a side note. That's why this is up here. Um, but with your um, aqueous solutions, if they conduct electricity, it's called an electrolyte. Electrolyte just means that it has an ionic compound dissolved in water. Um, it, the reason why they conduct electricity is because you have positive charges, you have negative charges, because things are breaking down into ions, and the electricity is able to travel across it. Um, so when it says, like, on Gatorade, it's got electrolytes, or on Powerade, it's got electrolytes, it just means that it has ionic compounds in it, um, things like salt, which is why I can't drink Gatorade. All I taste is salt. I don't taste anything else other than, like, salty flavor. Um, I think it's disgusting. But the electrolytes just have your either polar molecules or your ionic compounds dissolved in it. And this is where first semester we actually took the light bulb and we put it into the different ionic solutions and then we showed that it conducted electricity. So if you have an ionic compound or a polar molecule dissolved in water, it's called an aqueous solution. And those aqueous solutions conduct electricity, which are called electrolytes. So that's as far as we needed to get today. Again, it's a lot of vocabulary, um, but we're actually going to start stepping into some math here, not tomorrow, but the next day, um, where we're going to talk about salvation, and then after we talk about salvation, we have the math at the end of this unit. If you guys have any questions, make sure you ask. Otherwise, have a great day.